verse number 8. We'll stand for the reverence of God's word unless you're physically incapacitated. Let's stand for the reverence of God's word today. We honor him. Amen. We honor him. Now, uh, we started a series last week entitled Triggers. Um, learning how to manage our emotions. Um, how many of you uh, can testify that in this week alone, uh, the enemy <laughs> triggered to you. <laughs> All right. All right. And so that's just confirmation that um, we are in the vein of God. And so I want to continue part two um, this week and we'll conclude triggers next week in Jesus name. All right, and this is what the word of the Lord says in James chapter 1, verse number 8. A double-minded man, a inconsistent man, a wish-washy woman, a up-and-down individual, A committed today, uncommitted tomorrow. Person is unstable in all, all, not just church, not just family, not just financially, but they're unstable in all of their ways. Verse 9. Verse 7. Yeah. Verse 6. My God. But let him ask this individual, this woman, this man, let him ask in faith nothing, nothing wavering. For he that waver is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed by the wind. Verse 7. Let this person be not deceived. <laughs> they not receiving nothing from God. For a double-minded man, a double-minded woman, an inconsistent individual, a sometimey person, is unstable in all of his or her ways. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. We thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, that there's freedom in your word. There's no condemnation in your word. God, you didn't bring us here to beat us up. You brought us here to grow in you to better ourselves in you, to become consistent individuals in you. Father, we thank you for this word. Now, Father, I'm asking you that our hearts will be receptive to your word. May it fall on good ground and not thorny and rocky soil. But Lord, permeate our hearts to receive this word so that it can take root in us and take us to where we need to be in you. It's in Jesus' name I pray and all of God's people say it. Amen. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Somebody say triggers. 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 Last week as we began to lay the groundwork for our brand new teaching series entitled Triggers, Learning How to Manage Our Emotions. We talked about creation and how when God made man or when God made Adam, which is the Hebrew word for man or mankind, the scripture says that God formed us. He, 
He fashioned us. That word form in the Hebrew is yatsar. It means to form like a potter does clay. He formed us. He fashioned us into his image. And although some animals and humans show some aspects of common design, it is the unique creation of mankind that distinguishes us from all other creatures. For the Bible lets us know that when God made man, he gave us something very powerful and very unique, if you will, that lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, did not possess. And if you weren't able to join us last week, we learned that uh, the distinction in particular was something called dominion. Uh, somebody say dominion. Uh, that word dominion, uh, Elder Dez, in the Hebrew lexicon comes from the word rada, uh, which simply means to rule, to subjugate, or to dominate. And so because we were created in the image of God, there is no emotion in our anatomy uh, that God has not already given us the victory and the dominion over. Uh, look at somebody tell us. He gave me dominion. He gave me the ability to rule. He gave me the ability to subjugate. He gave me the ability to dominate. God has given all of us in this room, watch this, authority over our emotions. Uh, what are emotions? Emotions are feelings. Uh -huh. uh, emotions are feelings that uh, are the byproduct of our thoughts and actions and it is through our emotions if you will that we express our thoughts our desires our opinions beliefs and attitudes in in other words our emotions demonstrate watch this our interpretation of life and how we perceive life and how we perceive others if you will emotions watch this can be so powerful so much so uh, so much so that our emotions have the ability to affect our health and physical being. In fact, scientists have proven that emotions like worry can lead to ulcers. Uh, stress, chronic stress, if you will, uh, can lead to high blood pressure in the body or how for Forgiveness is linked to bettering your immune system and increasing your lifespan. Uh, some of you have no idea that you're uh, selling your life short. You're cutting your life short because you refuse to be a person that forgives. Mm. Uh, what are you saying, Pastor? You owe it to yourself uh, to manage your emotions because if you don't manage your emotions, your emotions will dictate and manage how long you live. I feel something pushing me, Bree. If you help me, I promise you, I'll close this thing. Uh, yesterday, I was eating breakfast uh, with Pastor Tommy. I was eating breakfast uh, uh, with Arch Archbishop Mike, if you will. I, I was eating breakfast with them, and we were talking about how this series has impacted our lives already. We, we were talking about how how in just this past week we were faced with various things that triggered our emotions as men. Uh, we talked about the frustration of driving on the highway. We, we, we talked about the frustration of a vehicle breaking down. Y'all not saying that. We talked about uh, the challenges of trying to raise uh, children in this culture. And the Lord spoke to me uh, at Cracker Barrel in the midst of me eating my buttery brown crispy around the edges pancakes if you will oh my God from Zion and Galilee he spoke to me and said watch this a man who is not in control of his emotions is a man who's not in control at all a rewind plus pray here it is a man who is not in control of his emotions or woman that is not in control of his or her emotions is a woman 
or man that is not in control at all. Hear me, you may not be able to control your emotions, but you can control how you respond. Oh God. First oh. Samuel uh, chapter number 16. Uh, uh, here in our text, the Bible says uh, uh, that the prophet Samuel uh, is a morning the prophet Samuel is mourning the prophet Samuel is mourning he's mourning because uh, the Bible says in first Samuel chapter number uh, 15 that God came to him saying Samuel your boy Saul has disobeyed me and I regret the fact that I even made him to be king God, so put that on the screen if you will. First Samuel chapter number 16. So the saints don't think I'm lying. First, cha- First Samuel uh, chapter number 16, verse number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, verse number one. The Bible says that the prophet Samuel, he's mourning. Here it is. And the Lord said unto Samuel, and the Lord said, Yahweh said unto Samuel, how long, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel fill your horn with oil get up off of the floor and I will send you someone for I raised someone up oh, at Jesse's house a king is amongst his sons oh God the Bible says that uh, Saul was or Samuel was mourning he was mourning and God came to him in first Samuel in the chapter before and said I regret the day that I made Saul as the king. I regret the day that I put him in position. The Bible says uh, that when Samuel meets up with Saul, Saul said, Samuel, how you doing? I, I want you to know, Samuel, that I've been obedient to everything you told me to do. I, I was obedient, Samuel. I was obedient to everything you, you told me God said to do. Uh, but Samuel, watch this, he says, uh, well, if you were obedient then why do I hear the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of oxen in my ears let's bring it home God told you God told you Saul God told you to kill the cattle but you kept uh, the cattle for yourself Uh, Saul said I was going uh, oh God uh, uh, the reason why I kept the cattle even though God told me to get rid of it uh, the reason why I kept the cattle of Samuel is because I was going to uh, I was going to present the best of the cattle uh, the, the, the best of the oxen the best of the goats if you will and I was going to use them for praise and worship as a sacrifice uh, but Samuel said to Saul he said obedience to God is better than sacrifice I want to park right here for a commercial break if you allow me and let somebody know today that partial obedience is still a disobedience you ain't got to clap I got one praiser from New Jersey that'll back me up in this service obedience is better than sacrifice it's better than sacrifice and partial obedience is still a disobedience come on you can't shout your way over disobedience you can't serve your way over disobedience come on you can't sing your way out of disobedience and hear me anytime you are living in disobedience meaning that you are not in right standing with God that is not the time for you to prophesy that is not the time for you to lay hands on nobody that's the, not the time for you to get up on the worship team and sing to nobody but that's the time for you to repent come on just because they shouted with you at the altar that does not mean they repented as a matter of fact after we shout I'm still gonna need my apology you don't hear what I'm saying Come on, just because we praise together, that don't mean that exempts you from apologizing. Why? Because obedience is better than... 
your sacrifice of praise that God ain't even received. Pastor, how dare you say that? No, no, no. The Bible said if you have an ought against your brother or your brother has an ought against you, don't bring me no, no, don't bring me nothing until you go get it right with them. And um, I want to ask you a question. When is the last time that God has received your worship? Because what I've learned is that when you really hear me, when you really want to be right with God, you'll be willing to make it right with people. Minister Tommy, I'm so tired of these deep people who are really shallow. That think that as long as they got King Jesus. As long as they got a prophetic word over their life, that means that exempt them from going through the process. You want to prophesy, but you don't speak to people in English. You want to preach the grace and forgiveness of God, but you hold grudges? Look at somebody tell them, you ain't ready. Ain't ready. When you've been called into ministry, you gotta be willing to die for this. That clergy collar that I wore last week and that I wore on first Sundays is not a Halloween costume like some of y'all wear it for. That collar around the neck, if you study the history of what that symbolizes, the, 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 the priests who were, who, the pastors, if you will, in that day in the early church, they would wear chains around their neck, dog collars, and the people that followed them were chained to the priest or the pastor's neck, and they would lead the priest into the Roman Colosseum, and they would release tigers and bears and animals, and the people who were uh, uh, heathenistic, the pagans, if you will, they, they, they would shout and they would rejoice at the shedding of blood and the murdering of Christians. But all the priest had to do was to denounce his faith and he would have spared his life and the life of the other people. That's why it's uncomfortable to preach in. Because the collar reminds you that you've been chained to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It means that you're a prisoner of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if I got to die for the gospel, oh God, I'll rejoice. I'll rejoice because I'll count it as righteousness to be identified with our Christ. Bishop Jake said something so powerful yesterday. In a eulogy, he said, many, many spiritual giants are falling. He said, but what I'm afraid of is that this new generation of clergy, we don't have no one to replace them because uh, we're, raising up, we're raising up midgets and not giants. Oh, God. Jesus said, so when you really want to be right with God, you'll be willing to make it right with people. Now hear me when I say this. That does not mean that after you apologize and they don't forgive you, that you keep on apologizing until they're appeased with your sacrifice. Look at somebody tell them, the devil is a liar. Come on, after I come to you and I try to make it right, after I come to you and say, is there anything that I've done? Is there anything else I can do? Listen, I'm not finna stutch you walking by me and meet and greet, rolling your eyes. Come on, y'all not talking to me here. I'm not finna keep on apologizing to you. You not God. At that point, you better get it right with yourself because your offense has nothing else to do with me.
tell somebody, if you want to carry it, you carry it. But at this point, it has nothing to do with me. Because people will try to sit in the seat of God and hold things over your head. Y'all never met nobody like that before. And so when you really want to be, when you really want, not when you want to be right with your pastor, not when you want to be right with, with, with your job, not when you want to be right um, so you can preserve your image and who people think you are, but when you really want to be right with God, you'll be willing to walk in humility and get it right with people. That's why the cross is the symbol that it is. It's a vertical Symbol and it's a horizontal symbol. The vertical part of the cross represents our vertical relationship with Christ. But the horizontal piece represents our relationship with the people to the left and to the right of me. That does not mean that we got to go out to eat. That does not mean that we got to hang at each other's house. But I cannot walk in Jesus said, how can you say that you love me? Oh, God. How can you say that you love me in whom you have never seen? Am I doing okay, Kamika? How, how can you say that you love me in whom, that, who, in whom you've never seen but hate your brother and your sister in whom you see every day. The Bible says you are a liar and the truth of God is not in you. If we never go out, if we never grow any point from this, I'll never stop preaching this gospel. I'm never going to start preaching a seven-step message to, 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 to better peace. I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can you say you love me? I hope this message triggers you. It should. Because all triggers not bad. Some things trigger you to destiny. Some things trigger you to betterment. Some things trigger you to maturity. And so if you can just be disciplined enough to get out of your feelings and eat this word. There's a new doctrine. There's, there's a new doctrine. There's a new doctrine that the scripture tells us to be mindful of these new doctrines that come. There's a new doctrine and belief system that's being pushed in the church today. And it's called, watch this, the gospel of cutoff. There's a, there's a new doctrine, there's a new, there's a new heresy, there's a new uh, erroneous teaching. That's making its way in the church and it's called the gospel of cut off. Um, that's when, oh God, uh, uh, let me tell you something. Uh, cutting people off just because they disagree with you or you disagree with them is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says let the wheat and the tear grow together and the Bible said that God will do the separating. God will do the cutting off because when, when, because when we cut people off, we tend to create a crime scene and we get blood on everybody that's around us. Let's be honest. Have you ever cut the wrong person off? The gospel, hear me. Watch this, Nikki. The gospel of cutoff is not biblical. I'm not encouraging you. Hear me. I'm not encouraging you 
to stay in toxic, toxic situations. I'm not encouraging you to stay in toxic environments. I'm not encouraging you to stay in toxic relationships. But when God does it, it's a smooth transition. The greatest sign to tell whether or not uh, uh, someone told God to leave the church is how they leave. Because if you leave a church slandering everybody's character, God didn't tell you to leave because you leave in bloody. If God told you to leave, then why are you trying to convince everybody else to leave to take on your offense? Oh, I got to come for that devil. Because that's exactly what it is. It's a devil. It's a demonic. It's, a, it's called the spirit of Jezebel. Y'all not talking to me here. The spirit of Jezebel is not a woman. The spirit of Jezebel is not a man. The spirit of Jezebel is a spirit. It's a spirit of manipulation that tries to build a kingdom within a kingdom. And it tries to build an alliance and an allegiance within the house. But I come to serve notice to that spirit that Jezebel will not live in this house. But the devil is a liar. Come on, I need you to I need you to open up your mouth and release a sound of praise in here. Every kingdom but the kingdom of God is going down. Every kingdom but the kingdom of God is coming down. Come on, somebody throw your hands up like this and say it's coming. Come on, every spirit in my house, every spirit in my children, Every spirit in my finances, every spirit in my mind, it's coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down. When God, when God does it, it's a smooth transition. It's a smooth, it's a peaceful transition. Anybody can cut something off. Our youth today for Youth Sunday, Lil Chris and you know Royce, Gavin, uh, uh, Mackay, they can cut something off, but it takes maturity to reconcile. It, just, it takes maturity to restore something. Anybody can get married, but it takes maturity to make it work. Oh, y'all a dry section. I appreciate this section over here. It takes maturity. To go through the fire. To go through the mud. It takes maturity to hang in there. Glory to God. Come on. See, when you're mature, see, when covenant means something to you, glory to God, you're not just loyal uh, when we're going to Del Frisco's and when we're going to Roof Chris uh, and we can eat lobster, uh, mac and cheese, and steak. But see, when you're a loyalist, uh, come on, you'll be down with me if we got to go to Wendy's and split a four by four. Y'all not talking to me here because loyalty is not predicated upon the circumstance and the goodness of the situation. Oh, God, I'm preaching good. Jesus. Jesus, the Christos, the hope of glory, if you will. Jesus. Jesus being fully God, fully man. Jesus. Oh, being fully God 
in the flesh, which means uh, because he was God, that means he did not lose an attribute to himself. He did not lose an attribute to himself called omniscience or omni, uh, uh, presence or uh, omnipotent. He did, not, he did not lose any God attributes even though he became God in man. He became God in man, which means that he was all-knowing. Watch this. He was all-knowing, which means that he knew that before Judas even became a fetus in the womb of his mother, he knew that Judas would betray him. Oh, but nowhere in Scripture, hear me, nowhere in Scripture did you ever see Jesus treat Judas any different from the other disciples, but he loved Judas. And he treated uh, Judas with respect. Uh, and he never, watch this, Jesus never cut Judas off. <laughs> Having a perfect knowledge. The God who created Judas, who is now in a human body himself. Come to Bible study. You'll learn some more. The God who created Judas in his all-knowingness, in his foreknowledge, if you will, he never treated him no less. And he never cut him off, nah, nah. He never cut him off, even though he knew what he would do. As a matter of fact, I'll take it even further. If you read the scripture, the Bible says that Jesus even went as far as welcoming the disciples into the house and taking a water a basin, which was the custom of the Jewish tradition to leave the water basin at the door. And when people entered the house because of their sandals and because of the dirt, because they did not have concrete, they had dirt on their feet. And so it was the custom of the house to take the water basin with a towel and they would wipe the feet of the disciples. They would wipe the feet of the guests that entered the house. Jesus, he didn't have a gold watch. He didn't have a Rolls Royce. Do you know what Jesus had? He had a towel. Because Jesus understood that even him being God, even him being God, he understood that the greatest symbol is servitude. We don't care about your microphone. Show us your towel. People who complain about serving people are not servants at all. If God came to the earth in the form, read your Bible. The Bible said, if, 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 God, if, God came, if God came into the earth in the form of the person of Jesus Christ as a servant, who do you think you are to think that you're above serving? Jesus never cut him off. Why? Because, here it is, if you read the story, if you continue to read the rest of the story, watch this cue, as it pertains, hear me, from the life, as it pertains to the life of Judas, if you continue to read the gospel story, you will see that because you were created in the image of Christ, oh God, uh, you will see that you would never have to cut people off because who's not for you will eventually hang themselves. If you read the Bible, you'll shout right there. The Bible said that Judas felt so bad to the point he took the 30 shekels of silver and he threw it back at the, at the, at, at, at the Jewish uh, uh, um, rabbis and, and, uh, uh, and Sadducees and, 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 and Pharisees. He threw it back at them because he regretted. And the Bible said because of the hurt, he couldn't live with himself. 
And so he went and hung himself. Quit trying to cut people off because eventually they'll hang themselves. But pastor, look at somebody, tell them, let God do the separating. Tell them because if you cut people off, you'll make a crime scene. You don't know what they did to me. Pastor, you don't know how they hurt me. You have to be mindful of people who use their hurt as a form of manipulation to control you. They've been delivered. They're just addicted to the attention of being hurt. Pastor! I just can't control how I feel. But I need you to lay hands on your own emotions. Lay hands on yourself and say the devil is a liar. The moment we buy into the lie that we cannot manage our emotions, hear me, is the day you become a victim of your emotions. The day you buy into the lie that you cannot manage your emotions is the day that you become a victim to your emotions. God in the beginning gave you dominion. But pastor, what about my anxiety? You got dominion over it. Pastor, what about my fear? You got dominion over it. The moment we buy into it, the lie that we cannot manage our emotions is the day we become a victim to our emotions. The people around you the circumstances around you should never make you act or behave any kind of way. You should never give someone that much power to control how you go about your day. The devil is a liar. Come on here. If I walk into the room uh, uh, with my husband's ex-wife, it's not going to make me sour. I don't have to prove nothing. I don't got to strut any different because evidently he left you for a reason. And I got, y'all not talking to me here. You got dominion. I pray that God will deliver some of you from the spirit of performance. Watch this, Kyra. Feeling like you got to perform before they commit. <laughs> Shall I preach okay? So, so, you should never, you should never give someone that much power. 
I got to leave the church because me and sister so-and-so had a fallout. What? Hold on, hold on. Let, let me get this straight. You said that God called you here. And so if God called you here, then, huh? Some people will try to get you to leave because they want your place. And you cannot afford, watch this, to miss out on your destiny because others have mismanaged their moment. God. How long, Samuel, will you mourn? Watch this. Over what I rejected. How long, Samuel, will you mourn over what I changed my mind about? God had already provided a replacement and an answer for Samuel's situation. But the reason why God asked Samuel, watch this. The reason why God asked Samuel Q, he asked Samuel, uh, how long? Is because by this time, he should have been over. God gives you a moment, not a lifetime. Even the strongest Christians have moments. Even pastors have moments. Don't put me on no pedestal. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're looking for a perfect pastor in a perfect church, this is not the one. We can dismiss your membership today because I, ain't, I am far from it. Don't put me on no pedestal. I want to live. Amen. So watch this. It's because the reason why God asked them how long is because Samuel had a choice now. If he was going to come out of it or stay in it. The more we praise, the more we worship. He's going to mature our response. 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 So you have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my God life. God cannot rescue someone and who thinks they're not drowning. If you're here today you and you desire to be saved, maybe you've been you drowning in sin. Maybe you've been drowning in your emotions, in anger, in bitterness, in unforgiveness. Whatever you've been drowning in, God has given you a choice today. He's given you a choice today to not only make it right with him, but to make it right with people. If that's you today, in your humility... I want you to walk to this altar, not with your head down, but with your head lifted. I believe God is going to give you the strength to overcome the things that trigger you. I'm not begging you to come. 
I'm free. You, have you gotta want it for yourself. You I see them coming. Come on. Come on. JJ, they okay. JJ. And okay. I'll never. Between them and God. Just lift your hands right where you are at this altar.